Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. German film diva Romy Schneider, an innocent crowd pleaser who turned tragic screen goddess. Only few German-speaking actresses have made an international career. Her incomparable charisma, versatility and turbulent private life, however, continue to fascinate. Why was Romy Schneider far from the archetypical innocent teenager? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. The German-French actress Romy Schneider was adored during her lifetime and still is today, almost four decades after her untimely death. Both her aura and her passion for acting are unforgotten. Romy Schneider was, and is, one of the greatest German actresses ever. The fact that Romy Schneider's private life was spread all over the media made many people see her as some kind of a family member, or at least a friend they would accommodate in their living room while the TV set was switched on, or while she was smiling at them from a million magazine covers. She is unforgettable to generations. Schneider made more than 60 films during her career, which spanned nearly 30 years. Her films generally enjoyed more acclaim in Europe, where most of them were made, than in the United States. Rosemarie Magdalena Albach, known as Romy Schneider, was born at the end of September 1938 in Vienna. She was destined to become an actress. Her mother, Magda Schneider, was the star of the German cinematography, and her father, of the Austrian origin, Wolf Albach Retti, descended from an actor's family and continued following in the footsteps of his predecessors. When Romy turned four, Magda and Wolf divorced and the kids were sent to a Bavarian village to their grandparents. Soon the mother married a Cologne restaurant keeper, Hans Herbert Blatzheim, and the actress Trude Marlene became the father's new wife. The children, who had not been the priority, were left with no parental attention. In the fall 1944, Rosemarie entered an elementary school. Five years later, she continued her education at a girls' boarding school at the Augustinian Canonesses near Salzburg. As one of the nuns confessed in an interview, the mother rarely visited her daughter. The father and grandmother never did. In her school days, she discovered her passion for acting, which is why she was often on stage at theatrical performances at the residential school. As the young woman left the school, she was going to enrol at Cologne Academy of Fine and Applied Arts, but life turned out to be different from the plans. Romy's first film was made when she was 15. The movie was titled When the White Lilacs Bloom Again in 1953. When the girl learned the news, she was on cloud nine. It was her cherished dream. She was only 17 when she played the title role in Sissy, a romantic movie about the young Bavarian princess that became the Empress of Austria. The film was Schneider's breakthrough. It turned the Austrian-born actress into an instant 1950s film diva. It was not her first appearance in front of film cameras, but the decisive one, because after that she was a star. The incredible success attracted some of the sequels, for example. The popularity was, however, quickly became a curse. In Germany and Austria, they wanted to see you only as Sissy. Yes, I loved this role back then, Schneider said. I was the princess, not just in front of the camera. I was always a princess. But one day I simply did not want to be a princess anymore. Despite the success, Schneider was desperate to get away from the naive and innocent characters that she was made to play in post-war Germany. Sissy sticks to me like oatmeal, she said. Her consummate professionalism, her talent and sensitivity enabled her to make an utterly convincing transition from the naive teenager she played in the 1950s to the sophisticated woman of her later films. Her subtle emotionality and raw vulnerability have never ceased to captivate large audiences. In her first films, she was the archetypical innocent teenager, fresh-faced, cheerful, naive, with just a hint of coquettish flirtatiousness. The three sissy films only reinforced this image and led to increased demands for her to play similar parts. In the imagination of national and international audiences, the actress became one with her role. She was inundated with film offers, but firmly typecast as the innocent teenager. 
In 1958, Romy Schneider withdrew from the influence of her mother, and thus also from the German movie industry, and went to Alain Delon in Paris. From today's perspective, Romy Schneider's possibilities in those days were almost limitless. She played theatre in French with the Italian director Lucino Visconti. She shot films in England and France, Spain and the United States, and then again in the Federal Republic of Germany. She had a go at comedy, melodrama, psycho-thriller and historical film. What her American directors Orson Welles and Otto Preminger, as well as the comedy directors Clive Donner and David Swift, have in common is that they treated Romy Schneider as if it were her first time in front of the camera, eliciting new and yet unknown facets in her acting and an intensity bearing witness to her great talent as an actress. She starred with Alain Delon in the movie Christine, during the filming, Schneider fell in love with her partner. She arrived at the shoot in Paris. She met many fans. Alain Delon, too, came to an official meeting with a bouquet of scarlet roses. Delon did not like his partner, and he even said something unpleasant to her. The relationship of the partners on the set, too, did not develop. Both were very different. She was brought up in a rather strict German tradition, and Alain was this windy Frenchman with an explosive, unrestrained character. She was a European celebrity. He was still no one. Romy Schneider did not only change in her private life, but also on screen. Instead of the virtuous girl, she became a sex symbol. The amount of uncovered skin in her movies increased substantially. Her makeup changed too, along with the nature of the characters she portrayed. The latter became rather tragic in many motion pictures. Sure, she experimented and learned over time, but the actress was a genius. Since she never set foot in any acting school, not even for a minute, everyone was and still is convinced she had inherited her gift. The camera loved her, and she loved the camera. This is the accurate conclusion Frederick Baker came to while working on a documentary about her. Some colleagues and directors believe that some of the roles she played in the 1960s and 70s had a lot in common with Romy Schneider herself. This was something she disputed. Anyone who thinks I am like the characters I play is an idiot, she said. After this movie, Romy Schneider and Alain Delon became lovers, but they constantly argued. However, immediately after they finished shooting, Romy flew to Paris to see Alain. Alain rented an apartment and they began to live together. Romy's family was shocked by this immorality and insisted on a formal wedding. In 1959, Alain and Romy got engaged, but their constant quarrels and scandals continued. Alain Delon was always the initiator of scandals in their relationship. He could get into an argument with Romy and leave her for a long time. Then he'd come back, he'd be forgiven, and everything went on as before. Romy and Alain flew together to Italy. Director Visconti filmed Alain Delon in his film Rocco and his Brothers. Tense shooting, joint work in the play What a Pity That You Slag did not leave time to prepare for the wedding, although perhaps it was not the reason. They could not get along, get accustomed to each other. During the summer of 1963, reporters photographed Alain Delon in an embrace with some blonde. A month later, Alain told Romy through a friend that he was going to part with her and that he had another woman. Romy found out that Alain was married and had a son. Two years later, Alain Delon, with his wife Natalie and son, moved to conquer Hollywood. But Delon did not bring much success to Hollywood movies. Parting with Delon wasn't an easy ordeal for Romy Schneider. It was rumoured that she wanted to commit suicide. Then she met Harry Mayen. He worked in the Berlin Theatre. Harry dated Romy and even divorced from his first wife. Soon they were married and had a son, David. It seemed that life began to improve but it was just an illusion. In 1969, Alain Delon phoned Romy and offered to join her in the film Swimming Pool. Romy agreed. What did she expect to work, or to revive old feelings? After the filming, she recalled that it was nothing more but a passion on screen, but journalists wrote about the reunion of the famous couple, printed photos where Romy and Alain hug at the airport of Nice while saying goodbyes. Their reunion never happened. However, Romy family life derailed. Harry could not forgive her affair with Delon. He drank and fell into a depression. In 1973, they divorced. Their son remained with Romy. 
After the divorce, Romy began to drink and soon faced problems with health. But it was in the 70s, in spite of the depression, alcohol abuse and the disease, Romy Schneider has played her best role. After her divorce from Harry, Romy married her young secretary, Daniel Biazzini. He looked a lot like Delon. She gave birth to a daughter, Sarah, but this marriage did not last long as well. The couple divorced and ex-husband took her daughter. In 1979, Harry Mayon committed suicide. Romy almost had a nervous breakdown. She accused herself of her ex-husband's death. In 1981, Romy's son David died a terrible and absurd death. He forgot the keys and had to climb over the fence with sharp stakes, which killed the boy. Romy was inconsolable. She would not go outside and only met with Alain Delon, who supported her as best he could and helped her with the funeral. Romy only briefly outlived her son. Romy died at her home on May 29, 1982. It was said that she committed suicide, but the verdict of doctors was heart attack. Because an autopsy was not performed, it will never be known what happened. A suicide was ruled out. At the same time, everyone knew about the alcohol and tablet addiction she had been suffering from, and maybe still was, until her untimely death. The mystery remains unsolved many years after the fact. The Franco-German icon is only 43 years old and leaves behind her only daughter, Sarah Bicini, then five years old. Since that day, several versions exist around the death of Romy Schneider. For example, the journalist Evan affirmed in his book Romy Schneider, published in 2009, that she didn't kill herself, but that she would be dead of her excesses, that is to say, of an overdose. Except that this hypothesis was denied by Claude Patin, one of his relatives. According to the latter, the interpreter of CC would have died naturally, as had already been observed at the time. In an interview for Paris Match, her friend recalled that she was happy and therefore had no reason to commit the irreparable. This famous evening of the drama, Claude Patin and Romy Schneider were together before leaving around 4.20 a.m. For her, there was no bottle of wine, no medicine at Romy's. She would simply have died of a heart attack. And to support her version of the facts, she clarified that the actress would have refused my tranquilizer not to take another one afterwards. Yet other versions say that alcohol and drugs were apparently found on his desk, where an unfinished letter lay, but also in the book Three Days in Quiberon, published in 2018, where the actress is portrayed as deeply dependent. Faced with so many allegations against her mother, Sarah Bicini, her daughter, denies outright. Romy Schneider has never been addicted to any substance, but impossible to know the truth since the magistrate in charge of the case did not follow up for an autopsy for Don't Break the Myth. The funeral was planned by Alain Delon. Mother and son were put in a grave together. Delon brought red roses to her grave, like those he brought when greeting Romy at the airport in Paris. The end of her life was difficult. In 1981, she found out her trustee had misappropriated her entire fortune. Due to a tumour, she lost one of her kidneys. At first, she kept on talking about wanting a family. Once she had one, she escaped. She was jealous when others were more successful than she was, but also warm-hearted like nobody else, and she tried to live life to the fullest. Romy Schneider's filmography is just incredible. Many years after her death, she is still being missed by the showbiz and the audiences alike. Romy Schneider should have lived. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Romy Schneider? To this day, she is celebrated as an international film star and has a devoted audience of millions of fans.